Hello everyone, welcome to Brainwaves. Uh, today on Brainwaves we feature Dr. Susan Buchheimer of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at UCLA where she is the director of that center. Um, and the CCN, or the Center of Cognitive Neuroscience, is uh, dedicated to unraveling the mysteries of how uh, the brain generates the mind and cognitive phenomena. And she studies there a variety of, uh, the nature of a variety of brain diseases. But her, her personal scientific specialty is in autism, so uh, she's also the director of the Autism Center of Excellence at UCLA, where um, that center and the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience collaborate together uh, to uh, develop early detection techniques for autism using the CCN's powerful neuroimaging and, and genetic sequencing technique, uh, uh, technologies. So, um, uh, Susan, thanks for being on the show. And thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Good, good. You're, you're absolutely welcome. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, to start out, how did you get involved in autism early detection research? Uh, that's a really good question because I was not trained as an autism researcher and it was, um, it was kind of a surprise. I was an epilepsy researcher initially, that's where my initial training came from. And while I was studying epilepsy, these new technologies for brain imaging were, were being invented and they're very important for epilepsy for um, diagnosing where language and memory are located in the brain for surgical candidates. And, but the reason why I got into autism was because of a, a very famous autism researcher, Dr. Marion Sigmund, um, who died a few years ago. She has been leading, had been leading the autism efforts at UCLA for many decades. And um, the NIH came out with a new proposal to try to get autism researchers uh, to work together in teams looking at clinical and neurobiology and genetics together. It was the first time that this has been um, done by the NIH that they mandated that people from different levels of analysis get together. And so Dr. Sigmund called me and asked me if I would um, write an imaging portion of her grant on autism. And I knew nothing about autism. Um, but me and my, my postdoc, Dr. Morello DePretto, said, well, you know, what, what can we do? She really needs this. So we'll just write our section and it will never get funded and we'll never hear from this. <laughs> and that was about almost 20 years ago. Um, but once I started, I was hooked, and I've been working ever since in the in the area of autism. Wow, well, that's great, and and, and autism research is better for it. So, Thank you. oh yeah, you're welcome. And uh, so, what are your goals in conducting autism early detection research? Well, so the main goal is to try to understand uh, what are the earliest changes that occur in the brain um, that relate to autism that are that are going to tell us who's going to get autism and to intervene before the disease really strikes. The thing with autism is that we know that the earlier the intervention is, the better the outcome is. Um, but unfortunately, most children with autism are not diagnosed until they're three, four, and in some cases, five and six years old, and, and some, of course, not so much later than that. So by the time a child is that age, there is not as nearly as much that we can do to really change the brain, the way that the brain is being wired up. But if we can identify individuals who have a high genetic risk for autism um, and whose early signs of behavior and brain look as if they're going in this direction, our hope is that we can intervene right then and uh, treat them even before the symptoms appear and then hopefully put that child onto a developmental trajectory that will push them away from ever getting the diagnosis or at the very least about having it much milder than it would have been had we not intervened. That's fantastic and that's so important. Uh, autism, as, as probably many of you out there in the audience uh, watching know, is, is a, a growing, uh, growing, is diagnosed more and more often these days. It must um, certainly Yeah. So, um, so that's fantastic. You, you can start to detect autism early, but just how early in a baby's life can you now detect developing autism? And then to do so, what aspects of a baby's genes and neurocircuits and behavior indicate that they might be in the autism prodrome? Well, right now we're still in the research stages, so I don't want to claim that we can tell who has autism uh, early in life. But what we're doing now is we're looking for the early markers in groups of children in the hopes that soon we'll have enough information to diagnose at the individual level. But at the group level, there, there's quite a bit that we know. First, we have identified many autism risk genes, at, at least 30 autism risk genes. 
And we know that it runs in families at a very high rate. We know that, for example, if you have a sibling with autism, your chances of getting autism or being on the spectrum are somewhere around the 20 percent. So it's a very, very increased risk. And if there's more than one family member, the risks are much, much higher than that. So we can look at the genetic background and give us, um, and that helps us give us some idea who is at risk. Then there are other things that we can do as well. And at UCLA, we are we're looking at this from multiple perspectives. So there's there's brain imaging. Um, Dr. Joe Piven's group from UNC had just published a paper last year looking at white matter development. That's the development of the connecting parts of the brain, the white matter that that allows different areas of the brain to communicate. And um, and he, he, they were studying um, infants um, as young as three months old um, who were at high risk for developing autism and found that those children, those infants that were at high risk for autism because they had a sibling with autism had an abnormal trajectory of white matter development. And it's very specifically that they seemed to start with too much but they didn't develop at the same rate, and so that the typically developing kids passed them um, very early in life. So we know that there are brain changes that probably occur in the first three months of life. We're now looking in the first six weeks of life, and we're looking for how the brain responds functionally and how it's developing structurally at the same time to look at those differences. So we know that, that there's something about how the brain is forming connections um, probably in the first few months of life, that is different in individuals who will later turn out to have autism. And then finally, we're looking at behavior. So we're looking at signs of um, uh, early signs of subtle differences in behavior um, that might not be noticeable even by a parent and, and not even by a pediatrician. But if we measure it very carefully, we can start to see some differences. Um, one of the most important ones is, for example, whether children are more attracted to people or objects. And so we can look at the way they are orienting their attention um, by doing eye tracking technology. We can also do some EEG technology to, to map their, their um, uh, electrical activity of their brain when they see faces and how they react to that. And we are now finding that by about six months of age, uh, we can see differences in children who are ultimately going to develop autism in whether they are showing a preference for people versus objects and in how their EEGs are responding. So um, there are other more subtle signs um, early in life and as they get a little bit older, things like responding to um, uh, calling their name and then uh, later on whether they are able to engage in what we call joint attention, whether the child and the mother together can focus on something else and in particular, something that we call initiating joint attention, where the child will see something novel and point it out and try to get the mom's attention to it. So that's what we call initiating joint attention. And those are very important early signs that is lacking in um, children with autism within the first year of life. So there are lots of these little things that we know are, are different um, before the diagnosis occurs. So what we're going to try to do now is to gather samples of all of these different areas of genes, behavior, brain, EEG, all of these things, put them all together and see if we can't now start to predict on a more individual level what child is more likely to get autism later on. And then we'll do some intervention early. Wow, so you have a lot of tools to, in your arsenal to, to, to evaluate things and a lot of parameters to evaluate to determine uh, hopefully to a high degree of accuracy eventually, you know, whether an individual child might develop autism soon. Well, there's so many pieces of the puzzle, right? There's the genetic piece, there's the brain piece, and there's the behavioral pieces. And um, any one piece might not be enough, but all of them together might give us the whole picture. Cool. That's great. That's great. You got all those put together. You, know, you can put all those together. Um, so uh, you've already gone over some early warning signs um, that, uh, that that somebody might notice um, in a child with uh, developing autism. Are, are there any others that you could the parent might look for? And then what should a parent do if, if did you recommend a parent do if they discover some of these early warning signs in their child? Well, there are a few other warning signs that you always want to, um, to pay attention to, particularly about the first year of life. Are they learning language at a normal rate? Are they 
um, coming up with words, and is the language that they are showing meaningful language? Um, for example, some children with autism can speak, but they might just repeat or echo what others are saying rather than use language for communication. So um, the rate at which children are learning language and learning it and using it for communication is a very, very important warning sign. And other warning signs that might not seem so obvious are motor delays. Children with autism um, will frequently, though not always, have motor delays. And then another whole range of symptoms has to do with how they interact with others and how they interact with toys. Some children might show a fascination with moving objects and, for example, they might spin the wheels of a toy car, whereas a, a, a better or a more typical play would be to pick up the car and use it to pretend that you're driving the car. So pretend play and symbolic play are very important developmental milestones, whereas lining toys up in a row so that they're nice and even, uh, um, watching things spin, using a toy for a purpose that does, is not, does not make sense, those are the kinds of other warning signs that you might want to look at as the child gets a little bit older um, uh, to, to raise a question. Now, these are just questions, of course. Children differ from one another quite a bit in how fast they get language and how coordinated they are, and it could be very typical. But uh, if a parent is worried and starts seeing some of these unusual behaviors, a lack of interest in others, not responding to their own name, not learning language properly or not using it properly and, um, and playing with toys in a very atypical way and, and not interacting with people but preferring to interact with objects. Those are all big warning signs and you should go to your pediatrician and talk about it. Unfortunately, a lot of pediatricians really aren't trained to diagnose autism. And so we strongly urge parents to go out anyway. If their pediatrician says they're fine, I would still go out, get into the community, find your local autism center, and get an evaluation. Um, there are uh, specialists in diagnosing autism. Uh, we have an autism center at UCLA where we um, see children who are quite young and evaluate them, and most big cities do, most universities do. Um, but if you're worried, you, you should pursue it. Don't wait until it's too late because if we wait until the children are three or four or and by then they're way behind, there's a lot less we can do to help. Okay, okay. So um, what, uh, if, if you, when you determine that a child is in the autism program, if, if it's a parent brings a child in and then showing these early warning signs and you evaluate them and they seem to be in the program, what, uh, what preventative treatments can you provide and, and how will you succeeded with these? There are a lot of different treatments um, now that are available for children with autism, and they range quite a bit. And the, the right treatment for the right child will vary depending upon many aspects of the child. But um, the kinds of treatments that we tend to do are early behavioral treatments that focus on teaching the foundation skills that will allow children to develop more normally. In particular, teaching children how to engage in joint attention with others, how to attend to um, the eye movements to, to people, um, learning to how to share attention, and learning how to play symbolically. All of these are, are very important foundation skills because once a child gets to the point where they're paying attention to their parent and they're looking to their parent to cue them about what they should be attending to, then that creates a background in which they can learn many other of the critical skills like language. We learn language socially. We learn it by by watching what our parents are trying to communicate to, to us and, and imitating it and using that in, the, in communication. Um, so to, so we, can, we have treatment programs that help uh, teach parents as well as, as um, having professionals teach children how to engage in that joint attention um, so that they can now focus on what's important to focus on and we can move them towards that direction. There are other kinds of treatments. There are many kinds of, of treatments. Uh, pivotal response treatment is another one where you're looking for a, a very specific kind of behavior and you respond to it immediately to get the child's attention to respond to what exactly it is you want to respond to based on what that specific child's needs are. And then there are also classic behavioral treatments that tend to focus on, on training specific skills that children need to know. And that tends to be used a little bit later on although it can also be used for, for language. Um, but any of these treatments tend to be intense. They tend to um, have to involve parents 
um, because the parents have to take what we do in, in, the, um, in the clinic home and do it all the time at home. And all of them are geared towards trying to get the children to pay attention and attend to people and to become part of the social world. Because once they're doing that, then they can benefit from the ongoing interactions, which will build language and build these foundations, these connections that are so important for social engagement as they develop. Sounds like a great program. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, so, so uh, if a parent would like to be like to involve their child in, in your program, how can they contact you? Um, they can contact us at UCLA, and we have a website called www.autism.ucla.edu. So, autism UCLA edu, and you'll get to our main website. And that will have information on all the different studies we have. We have studies for children of all different ages, including young adults. We have social skills programs for, for uh, young adults and teens. Um, and we have um, uh, some new medication studies, for example, that are, we're trying out some new medications that we hope are going to uh, work with behavioral treatment to try to improve outcome. And um, in particular, if you are a mom who is pregnant or thinking of becoming pregnant and you already have a child with autism, call us now um, because we can enroll you early on. And by um, what we will do in that case is we will work with you and your child from the age of six weeks on and we will follow you all the way through the end of the first year of life um, to check on all those early warning signs and give every one of these possible tests that we can to follow your child. So we're specifically looking for moms who are pregnant who already have a child with autism and maybe have one other relative who's affected or somehow on the, on the autism spectrum. Um, and at, at our website, you can find information about how to contact us or just to see all the studies that are out there. Even if your child may not be eligible, you might know somebody who is. We feel that it's very important for um, families with autism to participate in research so that we can help your next children and the children of the future as well as the children who are dealing with this now. Fantastic. I'm glad you're working on this and uh, I, I'm sure it will help a lot of people. Thank you so much. Yeah. So Susan, thanks for being on Brainwaves today. Um, and thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, if people have questions for you online after I post this video, are you ready to answer some questions for them? Oh, yes. Okay. Thanks, Susan, and uh, I'll talk to you soon. Great. Thank you. Okay. Bye.